Hello students, welcome to our very first class. It's an introduction and this class online video will show you what we're going to cover throughout the semester. So my name is Dr. Hill Krishnan and I have been teaching political science for almost 12 years and I'm happy to teach you and break down the concepts into simple easy, understandable, and accessible for everyone. And that is my goal, to have fun. And I hope you have fun as well in learning. Let's start with the very first chapter. You already should have had your syllabus by now and, and get the book and start reading and watching the lecture every class to do your assignments. The very first one, is to understand the post-world order. What is post-world order? Well, they're talking about World War II, after World War II. What happened in World War II, for those who have to refresh their memory, the Allies defeated the Axis powers. So the Nazis, the Germans, and the Japanese were defeated by United States, England, France, the allies, right? So now they created a world order. And and in that, right after World War II, they created economic systems to help the Western Europe and other third world countries later. And they are called Bretton Woods system. Bretton, B-R-E-T-T-O-N, Woods, W-O-O-D-S, Bretton Woods system. This was, in the name came because they all gathered near in New Hampshire in a place and it's Bretton Woods. So they took the name. So what did they create? They created IMF, International Monetary Fund. They created World Bank, okay, for giving loans and to alleviate poverty. They created GATT, General Agreement on Trades and tra Tariffs, which later become into World Trade Organization. So all these economic institutions were created of course un was created and there was a world order maintained by the victors even if you look at the un in the security council the victors dominate in the security council with the uh, veto power right and germany or japan is not in the in the part of that power now we're going to see whether the world order is changing and in this course and whether the global inequality that exists not only in power, but also when you talk about power, what is power? Let me break it down further. Power is extending one's will. So if it's, it could be an individual extending one's will to others to make others comply, do things which you want them to do, right? And states could do that. When I say states, for some of you might think of New York State or uh, Connecticut, it's actually countries, let me put it, but countries comes with state, regime, and government, and people. But there is harder for some people to understand what a state. It is a self-functioning entity of government, central authority, right? Like we have a federal government, and the United States is a state, England is a state, and I mean, UK is a state, and India is a state, independent states that function in the international arena. So now we're going to talk about how to study, go about studying this. Throughout this semester, we'll be studying different perspectives. And in this class, I'm going to give you just some of the perspectives, what we will use to study and levels of analysis we will do uh, to study this international order and understand the power inequalities and economic inequality. So when you say international political economy, it's usually studying politics, economy, and sociology. Politics is study of power, okay? And in a simple way, there's, there's more to it. But economics is study of international currencies, money, flow of money, all this, right? And now it doesn't happen in vacuum. So it happens in societies. So the third one circle, so it is like A intersection, B intersection, C. These three uh, 
joint circles joined together in the intersection of this is where this field exists. The third one is sociology, where society is coming. Correct. Right? Now, let's talk about the uh, perspectives. Perspectives to study this. There are five perspectives, and then we're going to do four levels of analysis, and then we're going to talk about five structures. So five, four, five and then we are done with this lecture, okay? So it gives you an idea of what we're gonna talk about today. Do not worry if you don't, don't get into deep because we're not gonna go deep in the first lecture. Each of this topic I'm gonna talk about today, we're gonna talk about for a whole separate videos. So don't worry about it. So now the first one I wanted to talk about is the perspectives, different perspectives to study this field. The first perspective is called um, economic liberalism. Now, economic liberalism, liberalism is spelled L-E-L-I-B-E-R-A-L-I-S-M. What is economic liberalism? There's two types in it. Orthodox economic liberalism mean, are you ready? Freedom of markets. Freedom of markets from who? From the government. What do you mean markets are free? That means government does less intervention in the market. Market is what? Now you might ask, because some people, this might be the very first class to hear this word. Markets is a place where buyer and seller meet. Like you could go to a fish market, vegetable market. Now markets are even online, right? Like Amazon has a market place, online market. So markets, are allowed to function with very minimum level of government intervention. So economic liberalism is an idea, a laissez-faire attitude. Um, and we will talk about this for a whole video. Do not worry, as I said. And this, these ideas come from Adam Smith in 1776. It's a Scottish philosopher, David Ricardo, John Locke. All these philosophers we will talk about. And these guys had this idea of markets should be allowed to function freely from the government. And that's, it, it, it gives freedom, not only to the markets, but also individual freedom for us comes from it. You know, individual liberties for us in the United States is written in the constitution, right? It's listed in the constitution, like freedom of speech, freedom of, to practice your religion, exercise your religion freedom of press all these are there what is that freedom from freedom from government intervening in your affairs so right to assemble and petition so in this country you have the right to march protest and that is from what so government should not intervene it's clearly written in the constitution to protect our individual rights from the government so now similarly the government has less intervention in the market so buyers and sellers meet and do whatever business of exchange of goods for money that takes place government should not intervene and set prices artificially should not tell how much you should sell every day what color of hat you should sell all these things and you might think who does that oh communist countries right they used to set prices and quotas how much to produce everything Commanding heights, the economy is completely controlled by the government. There's no private property. There is no free market in communist countries, uh, right? And imagine Soviet Union or China in, right after World War II, uh, 1949, 1950. So these countries ha didn't have a free market or private property rights. Everything is, is in common, state owns. Now, that is far extreme, right? Here, we don't want government to be completely gone, right? We are not dead opposite of that. We want government to be there and intervene in the market, not fully. So we're, what functions? Functions like courts, right? If there is a problem between buyer and seller, where do they settle the problem they settle that problem in a court and the court is the government so they are intervening and settling a dispute 
national security they provide security for the country and the companies in there right and police force somebody comes to your company and uh, buys it and was not happy threatens you cops come because they are state part of the government right police force and of course it's not central government it's local government the police but military in external threats from outside like sony was threatened by north korea right um, because sony pictures were making a movie about north korean dictator a comedy movie i don't know whether you remember interview and so in that case if they threaten the united states central government says obama said like we we shouldn't listen to a, a dictators from other countries telling us what to do in our business so i will government does step in in those worlds but so again economic liberalism orthodox is less government role okay whereas the opposite of that economic liberalism liberalism of orthodox is heterodox h e t e r o d o x heterodox heterodox economic liberalism is they want strong government intervention okay they do believe that government intervention will reduce problems what kind of problems are you talking about or oh, problems like for example 2008 financial crisis remember the the in the real estate bubble um the housing bubble happened right because when you allow markets to run as they want sometimes human greed could mess up things for all of us so in that case governments need to intervene and stop things from happening crazy things could happen it's like driving a car without a brake in my opinion a public uh, in in my opinion an analogy would be like a government is the brake that puts the brake because engine is like the market which drives the car you don't want to be in a car with your engine because you're not going to go anywhere but you don't want to be in a car however powerful the engine is it, without its brakes right you want the both so the heterodox economic liberalism want government intervention so that it prevents catastrophes economic catastrophes bubbles bursting and creating a mess for all the people uh, and people suffer suffer not just unemployment but scarcity and you know big depression created one fourth of the people were unemployed yeah people stood in soup kitchen lines and so even during pandemic when it started you saw how many people in cars waiting for food unemployment could rise so government have to step in and do so there's two types of views and you might think why this is just in us around the world these economic ideas are spread all these things we are going to talk about is ideas they are ideas and these ideas have an effect not just in one country but countries around the world so different states react and act differently and what type of philosophy they observe to and heard heard to has an effect on them and also the countries they are connected to okay so the first perspective is economic liberalism the second perspective is mercantilism m e r c a n t i l i s m mercantilism is a very it was practiced by most countries that's my clock from 15th to almost uh, 18th century and in mercantilism the states are thinking about one thing to increase their power how do they increase the power through wealth so they are interested in increasing their power to increasing their money and states will guide the economy will intervene in the economy so that <coughs> it it makes the state win so for example protectionism is part of it what is protectionism protectionism is um if you are producing uh, let me see this pen this pen 
for a dollar. And there is an, another country producing the same pen for a dollar. And it comes into our market. And if people are buying that pen more, and this pen industry of the United States might go out of business because people are buying that more. So government, say I am the government of the United States, I could put a tax on the foreign pen which is coming in and it's called tariff. Tariff is the tax on imported goods. So the goods which are imported inside the other pen are coming in, I could put say 10% tax on it. That will increase the pen price from a dollar to dollar ten. Now the United States pen is dollar, their pen is dollar ten. People will if, assume they're both same quality. People are going to buy the American pen more. And that is a way to protect this American pen company from being dead. And the protectionism happens because you are thinking about your own country's companies. Why? Well, one is jobs. Okay, and uh, both Trump and uh, and uh, excuse me, both Trump and Bernie Sanders w talked about protecting American workers from cheap goods coming into the country, even though they're politically opposite spectrum, right? So the mercantilist idea exists in this country, United States, and around the world, all the Western countries. Our forefather, founding father, one of them is Alexander Hamilton, who talked about protecting American companies. Why do you want to protect American companies? Well, I will talk about that when we talk about mercantilism. And not just for jobs, not for companies to flourish. And, but um, I will tell you that one of the more interesting reasons in, called infant industry syndrome. Now, mercantilists also look to improve their power, as I said. There are two types of power you have to understand. One is hard power, another is soft power. Hard power means money and military might. Both are hard power. So military might, you don't become militarily strong without money. Well, you need money to build a strong military, correct? The United States was like 16th, 17th rank when World War II started, correct? When the Pearl Harbor attack happened. We were in the mightiest military, but our economic might is strong and we converted the economic might into military might. We start producing all the home amenities and cars and started producing tanks and battleships and airplanes and we outproduced all the other countries which fought against us together. All of them together would have matched the number we produced and because of our economic might, and then that helped it militarily. You following? So mercantilism, hard power, money, wealth to power, and countries focused on it. And so they, they, they control the market to help them to improve their power. And so and you might think communism, communism don't even have a market. Everything is controlled by the government. Here they have a market, mercantilism. Soft power, what is soft power? Soft power, the second one is cultural ideas. Like for example, values also. Cultural ideas, values, common values like democracies. Oh, you're a democratic country and a democratic country. So we have similar values. So then you bond in that. It's like friends meeting and talking about, oh, you like that movie, I like that movie. So it's a way to bond. And so similarly countries attract each other with common ideas and values and capitalistic idea. It's an idea. Everything is a philosophical idea. And democracy is an idea. Non-democratic regimes like authoritarian countries, that is a form of idea that how they wanted to run. It's a philosophical idea, right? So <coughs> soft power is even Hollywood is, is using the soft power of the United States, our lifestyle, our way of life is shown to the world to entice them. And it is an indirect form of, one could even say coercion, or projection of power, okay? So hard power and soft power could be used. Now the third one, okay? We talked about economic liberalism. We talked about 
uh, mercantilism. We talk you know, about structuralism. Don't worry, we will talk about each of them in a separate video in detail. Structuralism is Marx's idea. You know, the Karl Marx, and he wrote this idea of proletariat and bourgeoisie. Bourgeoisie is in the top, proletariat, the working class, the upper middle class bourgeoisie. The working class will overthrow the bourgeoisie because the bourgeoisie is oppressing the proletariat. And so similarly, the structuralists observe inside countries their economic system of oppression going on. And even in the world, you know, other countries do have it and various forms of oppression happens. So we'll talk about that in, in when we talk about uh, structuralism. And we will be also talking about in this class constructivism. This is another way to look at and what is constructivism? Constructivism is that ideas and norms have an impact in, in an international political economy. And scholars who study constructivism says these ideas and, and your personal conception of you, the state's conception of them uh, can change their goals as their conception changes. And so it is, a, it, it's they, they're not like just focused on states only as actors. Like for example, mercantilist states are the only actors, like realist in international politics. If you have taken the international politics or international relations class, realism is a dominant theory. And that's how um, the, um, the mercantilists see the world. Whereas this constructivist sees non-state actors Non-state actors means what? State, I told you already, states has power and non-state actors are individuals. A terrorist group could be a non-state actor. And even NGOs have an influence in this area for constructivists. Their ideas of cultural norms have an impact. So they study this in, so these are different perspectives. We will talk about constructivists for a whole video. So don't worry, um, we're not going into it. And so I think I did mention all of them now. Um, let me double check. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Okay. And neoliberalism, I don't think I mentioned, uh, well, neoliberalism and social democracy, write this word down. Neoliberalism, social democracy, Neoliberalism means that is the orthodox economic liberalism. That's what. Number two, social democracy is the heterodox economic liberalism. Okay, number two. Number three, mercantilism. Number four, structuralism. Number five, constructivism. Each of this we'll see in a video. And social democracy, because I didn't talk much about it. Like Nordic countries are socially democratic countries. Norway, Sweden and uh, countries like Iceland, they have higher intervention in the market, Denmark, all this, Finland, all these countries have a higher uh, government role in the markets, okay? Okay, <clears throat> now let's talk about the levels of analysis. So far we talked about perspectives. Now we want to talk about levels of analysis. How do you analyze this international arena to study inequality, okay, uh, or other issues that arise in an international political economic arena. Remember politics and economics mixing. Before I go into studying these levels, you have to understand this field of international political economy. Political economy is how the field even started, the economic field. The very first book, 1776, Adam Smith wrote, called Wealth of Nations, is a political economy book. Throughout 19th century, it was like political economy. All the scholars who wrote, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, all these guys, we'll talk about them um, in a separate video. But only in 20th century, the field of economy, economics went away from politics and it became very mathematical and just focused on markets rather than bringing politics into it. But 
it doesn't function separately in the international arena politics economy are intertwined along with where it happens in society sociologically you have to understand so you can divide it um if you divide it it's it's harder to understand so it's good that you're taking this and you have a different perspective even if you're a finance major even if you're business major and you're looking from the market perspective this gives you another way to see that being said let's move on to four levels of analysis the first one is before i start the levels of analysis uh, there was a author called kenneth walls kenneth walls he used to define or uh, uh, study levels of analysis three uh, levels he would study individual it's the low level individual and then national okay individual means individual characters actors who play a role in an international arena so president biden is is an individual what his characteristics are like that before him trump what his characteristics and how it has a effect in the foreign policy and the policies they set their personalities their politics um democrat republican is their political party and that comes with certain policy changes so that is level uh, lower level and then you study in the mid level national level and then you study interstate of course kenneth walls was studying uh, for understand war so he wanted to study in three levels individual leaders who take countries to war and then national forces that happen inside of forces influence a state to go to war and then interstate relationships between say for china and the united states or us and india or us and japan all these relationships have an effect and then here not walls some scholars study it in a fourth level that is globally some issues you need to study globally so these are four levels now we're going to study here not for war because that will be an international politics or international relations class this is international politics economics and sociology related topic so for that you have to study these four levels so let's start from the top globally what issues do you study globally well one is climate change climate change needs to be studied globally correct because without studying it globally you can understand the issue by individual um, state what it do, does or between two states relationship you can understand overall how the global climate change is what it is even called so we have to study it overall and the development and proliferation of a uh, weapons especially um nuclear weapons or even international technologies how it has an impact globally right and and in this economic field especially there is a huge consequences on trade because of shipping containers a simple thing how almost all your goods from coffee to cars to uh, clothes everything is shipped and in, in the in interconnected world and that shipping reduced the prices of goods because the prices of shipping fell down they found easier ways to take this huge containers you know they put it on top of the ships and the cranes that used for doing that and then unloading it all this it's impossible to do just manually and this technology helped change where production happens because then you don't need to worry about because when the cost is lowered then you could find the places where it could be cheaply produced and shipped like your iphone is produced in multiple places many countries are involved even though if you look behind it it says designed in california it's not everything is done in america it's from china to different countries are involved in its production process so that's at least small but imagine cars and other things bigger ones and it comes from minerals to materials come from different countries 
and each process is done in different countries. It's amazing um, what that trade changes because of containers. So everything that could be understood only when you study it from a global perspective. Now, what about interest, interstate level? Interstate levels, you have to understand the alliances countries make between each other. You have to understand balance of power. What is balance of power? If you haven't taken an international relations class, you wouldn't understand. Balance of power is countries trying to balance. Let me put it this way. If there are four countries and this guy, okay, their neighbors, this guy is starting to get stronger, okay? He started to build military equipment and getting richer. And then because he's getting richer, he's starting to use that money to build more military equipments and train more military men, more armed men. What will happen to the other three? The other three are going to be anxious, worried about, worried because of this guy. So what these three could do is ally. That means join together force. That is alliances. That is one form of power balance against this. Because if they're independent, this guy could beat one by one, all, all the three. So the goal is to make sure that they stay together or individually. So if this guy is flexing his muscles, then this guy also can start flexing his muscles with um, using some of his GDP money to build the military, okay? And this guy uh, could uh, and get help from other countries rather than use his own money um, and to stand against it, the bully. So this way, this is called balance of power. It is a balance of power is there's an equilibrium when the states are in peace. And because one guy dislodges the equilibrium, this guy, and the others to preserve and protect each individual elements, the four ones, without going to war and prevent the war possibility, they balance and bring back the equilibrium by building their own way to stabilize the equilibrium. And that is, they could build alliances and borrow money and they could, um, they could build their own military might. All these are called balance of power. So now if we study this inter, in, interstate-wise, that is a way to understand what is happening. And that has an impact in economics, relationship between states, okay? Now, <clears throat> um, so some people would say, you know, example is United States allying with India is to balance the power of China's growth in Asia. So that is a good example for you to understand. And also, um, um, in, interstate-wise, you could study transnational corporations. Corporations are companies, multinational corporations. Uh, to understand them, you have to see how they cooperate and work with the different states and, and with their government. So this is both private and public getting involved in with interstate relationships. At the national level, or I could say also state or state soci societal level, there is different bureaucratic decision making. You know, bureaucracy, government is a bureaucracy. You go to DMV, it's a bureaucracy, it's everything moves slowly. And there is a bureaucratic decision making uh, that shapes the government's outcomes in a national level. Uh, because for lobbying, for example, there are huge lobbying goes on in weapons production because it's enormous amount of profit to be made and companies, not, I'm not pointing any particular company, but companies which manufacture weapons, for example, Lockheed Martin, North Grumman and Raytheon, all these companies um, are could lobby the government for personal benefits and and this, that changes the U.S. policy, and it also changes the trade policy. Um, for example, do you remember the idea of pen, one dollar, right? So the, there's a one dollar pen coming from outside. So this guy who is making this pen in the United States could lobby the government to say, hey, can you put a tax on the other foreign company pen so that I could thrive? 
and that is also lobbying okay so that is to understand that in a state or national level is important what about individual level the fourth level of analysis individual level you have to study a, a psychology of a leader psychology of a leader uh, how they behave it's a whole field called political psychology and then you could study the psychology of a terrorist leader or political states uh, um, legitimate leader or even like uh, people like federal reserve chairman like alan greenspan he was uh, he drank the Kool-Aid of iron rand and iron rand he was uh, i mean he completely absurd in her philosophy so he thought markets could self correct that means any time there was an error markets could automatically self correct it while well, he did in 2008 financial crisis and then he agreed wow uh, i always thought markets could self correct and self regulate but uh, market failed it's a market failure and market failure happens what is a fa- failure means not allocating resources to the people because it made many people go uh, homeless because they were not able to pay for their homes so if you are interested to watch this movie big short big short and it talks about how the financial bubble happened in 2008 so and you could talk about the psychology of leaders like trump or foreign leaders also individually not just domestically the foreign leaders like iranian ayatollah khamenei and the, the religious leader and political leader right and isis when it had caliphate to studying that you could understand uh, the effects it has in international political economy okay now we talked about different levels and let's move on to talk about our different structures so we're going to talk about f- five structures remember we talked about five perspectives four levels of study and then here five uh, five structures and that's it for this lecture this is an introductory lecture but each of this we will talk in detail later in different videos so don't worry um, if you don't get full me to understand now the five perspectives sorry five structures of uh, international political economy is the first one is production structure i talked about a little bit about it already like production has been changed revolutionized you don't need to produce products which you want in your own country because because of the containers the more, the cheaper it become to transport goods in containers shipping has changed to revolutionized so that you could produce products anywhere in the world it it includes like taking iron from one place and making steel in another country and using the steel to make cars in another country and then assemble when you make a car the body steel and then assemble engines and tires it could be done in another country so production process is so interconnected globally that it's incredible like a spider web and so and industries make huge sums of money and also the problems in it we'll talk about that later they evade taxes yes multinational companies many of them have this proclivity to not pay any taxes like zero taxes um, like uh, i forgot the exact year amazon for quite a number of years paid 0% federal government taxes i would like it would you wouldn't you yeah so the production process could be con- uh, taking place in mexico china turkey poland vietnam any countries they are interconnected and the trade structure the second structure we're going to talk about is international trade agreements countries create trade agreements between each other and national regulate <coughs> trade agreements could be that um you will produce this certain amount of uh, tons of iron and ship it and we will be able to ship this amount of coal to you and these countries create um, agreements and so then goods cross national boundaries and services also cross by the way it's not just the tangible products 
but intangible products like services across borders, right? And uh, m many of the services take place in the international arena. And so freer trade, freer trade means what? Less tariffs, less artificial barriers. So not creating artificial barriers and, and making sure that your goods, whatever you produce in your country, goes through to the other country without artificial competition. Like you put a $10, 10% 10 tax on that pen. Yeah, that is an artificial barrier. Okay. And so that is a trade structure. We'll talk about uh, trade structure and financial and monetary structure. Money is not the end. Money is the means to an end. So money is often view, uh, viewed as means. And uh, in a financial investment, fin they're looking for countries to invest money because wherever, whichever country is giving good rewards, return on investment, ROI, money is going to go there. And But also you have to reflect on the rules and regulations and obligations um, of uh, different nations from one nation to the other, how the loans must be repaid. And for example, we talked about IMF and World Bank. IMF, International Monetary Fund, gives loans to countries uh, to for for to improve their standards, to build structures um, um, like dams, roads, hospitals, schools. So they borrow money and f finance, but it's, it's it's a means to an end for development purposes, right? And security structure. Next one, fourth one. Security structure is feeling safe is important in the international arena as there is no no international government my professor used to say there is no 911 call the country cannot call 911 for an emergency so threats comes from other state actors like russia attacking ukraine the state one state attacking another or non state actors which is like the terrorist al qaeda attacked 911 in the united states so there are threats coming coming and the security structure, there is a security um, role played by the hegemon, H-E-G-M-O-N. Hegemon is the, the dominant power which does the police work. The United States does it because it comes with other rewards. We will talk about that later. It, 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 it is expensive because you're doing a police work and it is an international public good. You, you do that in order to uh, maintain security and order in an international arena. It's uh, so it cooperatively trade goods and other things happen. Say there are pirates, and still there's a piracy problem in many parts of the world. In countries, um, military is used for security of trading happening. Like near Somalia, have you seen the movie Captain Phillips? And if you haven't, check it out. It's Tom Hanks' movie. It's really good. That's the true story made into a movie. Uh, pirates hijacking an American trading container ships. And when it happens, well, we send uh, Navy SEALs. I won't give you m more information because you might want to watch the movie. Mm, so governments use its military force to protect and uh, so that the trade will go through without being impeded. The last one structure is knowledge structure. Knowledge structure means that it is vital. Knowledge and technology are sources of wealth and power. <laughs> knowledge, yeah, is a technology because it's not just uh, in industrializing a nation and pro providing cutting edge technology that improves its economy, but also in war making. Technology is vital for economic growth. And um, for example, um, um, steams revolutionized, steamship revolutionized um, from uh, ships which were sailing on wind. And then we have now airplanes, you know, which takes goods Shipping containers is how mostly the goods are moved now, but still, if you want faster and and, uh, and lighter products, which is a diamond export you're doing, 
why not airplanes you could send it and so the knowledge structure includes technologies like industrial technology especially will revolutionize a country's growth and increases the advantage of the country and skilled workers uh, intellectual property you know what intellectual property means right property is like you know land home house but intellectual property is something you might not be able to touch it it's like a home you could go and touch uh, someone writing a book an idea that is an intellectual property not the book itself what is written there the content and if somebody writes a music for example uh, many of the musicians write music that is their intellectual property they could make money off of it so patents are given to some of the ideas and internationally the patents cannot be violated like medicines some companies in the united states create patent then they will start getting patents around the world so that no one else violates that patent and uh, if they want to make products they have to ask as the permission from that company because they are the owners of that product so it gives incentives for them to make it's a controversial area in some places when it comes to certain medicines like aids and other things that we'll talk later so knowledge structure is also an important way to understand this inequalities between countries okay uh, so now it's i want you to it's a first lecture so I want you to learn from this video and tell me what you learned and respond to my prompt thank you see you next week